let's let's uh, move to the to the slightly bigger picture of the women's game now, Ebony. Uh, mm. it, it reached this this wonderful sort of peak with the Women's World Cup in in Australia last year, and then what's happened in 2020 sort of came <laughs> around. Uh, it's impacting all sport in different ways, and I just want your perspective on: Do you think a that it is probably hurting women's cricket more than men's cricket for a variety of reasons. B, what can women's cricket organizers, administrators, or even people like WCZ and Yash and his team, where we are trying to just figure out and feel our way around how we can play a small role in just sort of keeping the momentum mm. going, develop the sport, uh, bring more into it, bring more people into it. What would be your thoughts on the mm. subject and what could we do? So I think with the women, what we've seen with COVID for women's sport for me is we default back to what we know under crisis. And what we know, I suppose, is men's sport. I think the commercial engine behind men's sport is so powerful that when there's a fear of losing money, we go, go to where we know that money is. So what's happened positively is the performance of the women's game's gone up. They're the starting to be aware that there's a huge market, but it hasn't quite been converted yet to a fully commercial opportunity. And what I would say um, this crisis has taught me is that we saw the, the, the progress, the 86,000. Uh, we see 1.1 billion views from the ICC on the Women's World Cup. Over here in England, for example, the, the Women's World Cup final that was played against India was the most watched cricket match on Sky. So we're seeing that there is an audience. But what I would say is marketing to a women's audience and a family audience is different to how you market men's cricket. And so what I think we need to focus on over these next five years is a priority is to get women's sport commercially viable on its own. I actually think India is mostly the best possible place for that because of the passion of it, the numbers of the, the community. When India get behind anything, look at the IPL, the world changes. And actually, if if they're able from a commercial perspective to drive the, the next stage of the game, I think we all have to play our part, but I think that India has the biggest potential to be a game changer for women's cricket specifically, that would be it. But how it's done is I think it's, it's getting down on paper what I think we need to be more clear about the data. Like what, what are we seeing? What are the trends? What are the interests? Who is interested? What age? How do we need to market to them? How do we engage them? And I think it's different to how we currently market cricket. I think it's just slightly different. Um, but once women's cricket moves to a commercial model, which I think is possible, but I think we need to accelerate that. Um, then if we had a crisis again, you'd find that women's cricket or women's sport is as important as men because they're both commercial opportunities. Um, so look, the, the, the next stage is exciting. I think in some ways this crisis might make everyone get super focused on the recovery and then getting it to where it needs to be. Um, so I'm positive, but I also think we need to be a little bit more heads need to come together. Um, I think what you guys are doing as well in terms of continuing to share the message and having the, uh, you know a specific platform now which is dedicated and going to pick up on the rise you're mostly to be positioned for when that that complete um kind of acceleration from a commercial perspective takes off and uh, an awareness piece you guys will should be at the forefront because you're dedicating that extra resource so i think it's coming but i would love to see a couple of key commercial heads come together not so because i think the performance is moving i think you know india for example were behind for a while in their performance, but you noticed in the, you know, they're getting to the finals now, they're starting to up their game, there's a bit more investment going. So I think the performance can keep ticking along, but now it's got to be commercial priority to make sure that the women's game now capitalizes on the audience that we're starting to see. And, and along with that, uh, isn't there also, I think, uh, an opportunity, uh, Ebony, in terms of the associate countries? I mean, there is so much more cricket that is apparently being played by women in countries where the men's men don't even feature, right? I mean, Thailand mm. in the mm. World Cup, uh, Chile, mm. Brazil, Argentina, mm. right? Mali's playing, Mali. yeah, there's all these teams. All over the place where the men's cricket side is non-existent. They're probably not even associate members for all I know. And yet there is this, now how do we start bringing those women mm. uh, into, mm. an, uh, into an environment which gives them the opportunity to play with better people, get exposed 
to mm. better players so that their own games lift. I mean, it's a bit like you don't really want, and I don't mean any disrespect, I, I don't think we want it to be uh, Ireland or Holland in the men's game where the two or three really bright people realize that they've got to move to be able to, to you know, give, give rights or give, uh, give an opportunity for themselves to succeed. We don't want that. Mm. We actually want these, these countries to, to develop. So any thoughts around that in terms of the mm. nations and what, what can be done? Yeah, I think what, what I've seen with some of the ICC qualifying tournaments is that you're right, these fast moving teams like Thailand are possible. You almost um, equate it to like an Afghanistan in the men's team that they can come from not having that superstructure and, and to almost rising. And where I, where I think the, the key is just in putting in some basic good domestic structures, even if in a country you only have three or four clubs, as long as it's high quality coaching, um, and it's focused on finding good athletes like in quite a quick amount of time. We can see that acceleration. Thailand, I remember watching their final game against West Indies. I was commentating on it at the World Cup. And um, I think it was Butachan came out and whacked this 50, which was as good as seeing someone like Tammy Beaumont whack a 50. I was completely blown away and the excitement they had and the joy that that sent back to Thailand. So I think how it needs to be done, partly with what the ICC have, a much developing sort of upcoming nations uh, qualifying tournaments and things like that. I think that's great. I think we also, as senior countries, should do a little bit to keep making sure that we impart that knowledge, especially with Zoom and all these uh, digital platforms now. We can be sending information and insight on how we structure our development programs and stuff like that. Um, but the main thing is always investment, isn't it? I think, you know, what Thailand will see as a result of getting into the World Cup and doing well is there must be a little bit more investment. And, and the problem that you have to break is that you have to be successful before the investment comes. And you need people to see the opportunity and the vision and start putting money in to keep that flow. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited. I, I think the the potential in the women's game for a team to just come out and start to fly is, is there. Um, and if you actually, you know, like you say, if Thailand's women are doing well, I think that investment will come quite quickly. So um, we just got to keep the foot on the gas and keep sharing that that global message because one thing we don't want, and that's definitely what we don't want, is this just dominant three type situation, which is kind yeah. of there a bit now as well. For the men, it's kind of the same in the men and women's game, isn't it? Australia, India, England, kind of there. Then there's like a B pot and then it, you know, we want the, and, and I think COVID and the pandemic might actually force us as well to look at how money is spread around the global game um, and so as that happens in the women's game I think investment needs to be pushed into the right direction. Uh, as we sort of wind down to the end because I know you've got other other commitments uh, there are two things I want to talk about one is this whole uh, amazing effort that you are leading uh, in terms of the Black Lives Matter and how that whole piece has now become a worldwide movement. Yes, there are people who are, who have a particular view on it, and that's fine because you, you respect other people's views. But what is it? Are you seeing impact of that in terms mm -hmm. of the attitudes, uh, whether in sport or elsewhere, but particularly in sport? I know some of mm -hmm. the talent scouting and all that will help, but fundamentally, uh, nobody can or will disagree that all lives matter. But within the All Lives Matter, how do we bring awareness and focus and what can cricket do to make that even more powerful statement given the kind of following cricket has? Yeah, I think it's such a powerful movement. I have to, have to be honest, uh, in my whole lifetime, knowing that these inequalities, injustices, all these things happen, but also it's felt like the world's biggest secret sometimes that you know there's been no doubt that most environments are going to and if you look at the stats or you look at the data uh, the black community are often been seen or viewed at the, the bottom of the pile you look at our game for example zero black board members zero zero black people in positions of power anywhere in the game it's not that people haven't applied for these roles they've not been allowed into the club zero black academy directors zero black captains zero, you know it's just it's um it's you know that that data exists you know seeing data around biases that exist but no one's spoken about it. And what I think BLM has done is emotionally shaken up a lot of people. Um, for someone like me, who I might have been a little bit on the fence and nervous to talk about race, it's forced me to come out and be a, a more vocal piece. I think 
for some people who've been asleep and didn't know these things existed, it's woken them up to be more conscious and start to process. Um, for the ones at the far end who are never going to see it, it's maybe woken them up into some anger, but whatever it has done, it's, it's, it's triggered this um, consciousness and awareness of something that what that's led to is accountability. So I saw a piece this morning, for example, from our chief executive in, at the ECB in England, Tom Harrison, where he said it's got to change. The numbers are so bad that the, the, he can't exist without this being solved or at least some way tackled. And so that accountability piece has become really interesting. I've seen in the media, you know, that what you see in the media, for example, is there might be a few color, like faces of color on TV, but when you look behind the scenes, there's no directors, no producers, no board members. You know, that's always been the case, which everyone knows. So when this movement started, the accountability, the accountability for the, the justice system in America is now being called to the surface, corporate. So I feel like it's a, it's a difficult time. I feel like it's an emotional time for the whole world having to process whatever you feel about it, whether it's good or bad. It's, it's either in your face and you're thinking, why do I have to deal with this? Or you're on my end going, right, I have to get quite active. And one thing I say about Michael Holding and having the pleasure of working with him this summer um, is to see the strength of character he had has made me feel a bit stronger in myself of being able to stand up for what you believe in. Um, that piece that we did, I don't think I would have done it if it was me on my own. I knew Mikey was there and Mikey was going to hit hard and Mikey was going to educate. And it also allowed me to, my emotions were to feel it, you know, even just as I'm speaking now, it was a very emotional um, and teary, but it was also to have the confidence to be vulnerable um, because that's how I felt and that's how my experiences have made me feel. So where we are now is I hope, I think we've got an awareness. I think we've got advocates. Um, I think there's an accountability piece that is going to take years to kind of get through the, the emotional stress of it. But the, the awareness is the most important piece because this has been bumbling along. It's not just for the black community. I would say there's many underrepresented groups that I hope this movement starts to stimulate people looking at who is getting a fair crack in society and who isn't and why and start to really invest and support those those parts of the community to come up. That's fantastic. And more, more power to, to that movement and to people like you and Mikey. Because I think when you, if you replace the word black and, and sort of just replace it with all those people in whichever part of the world who have had more injustice than fair treatment, mm -hmm. I think that's really what it represents. And it's a great opportunity for cricket as a sport to, to bring mm. that to the fore. We've seen sort of knee jerks in places like Zimbabwe, God forbid, South Africa, where maybe sometimes it's, it's just turning turning turtle and, and it actually hurts the, the, the movement mm. in some way. So let's hope good sense prevails. I know there are lots of people who feel uh, strongly about it. I know in India, we certainly do. And WCZ uh, will, will certainly work towards that with, with people like yourselves. Thank you once again on behalf of uh, WCZ and my personal behalf for your time. Uh, I hope that you, you stay well, uh, look after yourself. And as we move forward, uh, this whole pandemic situation will not stand in the way of sport and women's cricket in particular uh, staying back. So thank you again uh, for your time. Pleasure as always. As always, Prakash, it was, uh, it was a joy. Thank you for your time.